Today is lecture 19. We'll be going over exchange channels. Uh, these channels pass data both forward through the requests and backwards through the enables or acknowledge. Um, and the, the requests uh, ultimately drive the exchange. So if there are no requests, the data uh, traversing in the backward direction stays put. Um, so it's effectively, in a way, a state holding uh, uh, protocol. So there are two types of exchange channels, uh, positive and negative. Now, positive exchange channels communicate data on the uh, upgoing rule of the enabled. So uh, when we, you know, we first receive our requests, uh, then we lower the enable. Uh, in this case, instead of just lowering a single signal, we are uh, reducing the enable back down to a neutral state. Uh, then when the requests uh, transition to neutral, we raise the enable up to a valid state. And uh, ultimately, this is kind of like a, a standard one of an encoding that we normally use, uh, just like we would use for the requests. Um, so neutral is zero, zero, valid is you know one, zero, or zero, one. So in CHP, we represent this by, uh, by channel actions, right? So we have L, and normally we'd, we just have like L receive or L send, but now we have L receive followed by send, right? So uh, we receive the value from the request into the, this uh, intermediate variable L, and then we send the value from V out on the enable. For R, we first send the value from the intermediate variable on L uh, down the requests and then receive um, the value from the enable into uh, our intermediate value V. And so you can see that uh, V is actually, uh, the value that's sent from V down the uh, enable on L is the a uh, value that's stored from the previous cycle. And so L will start by forwarding some initialized value on E, right, before uh, pulling in the next value from the right-hand side. All right, so we're gonna start with our normal WCHB uh, reshuffling. We have R to E and, uh, you know, the request on L, so L dot F or R to E and L dot T. And that drives our output requests, uh, r.f, r.t, right? This is standard one bit WCHB buffer. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, pull in our two enable signals uh, into this handshake. So we have r.ef and r.et. You can name them however you'd like. Uh, ultimately, it doesn't matter, but uh, again, they are a dual rail, you know, one of two encoding. Uh, with the valid states being one high, one low, and the neutral state being both low. And so here we're just checking, is the uh, output enable valid? Uh, if so, then we can forward on R. And then here we're checking, is the output enable neutral? If so, then we can reset R. Okay. The next step is that when we forward on R, like the moment that we send out a request on R, these output requests will start transitioning to neutral, which means we'll lose all information about the value that was stored on those output requests, uh, which means that we need to store that value in our forward drivers using our intermediate forward drivers. So we break this down into four separate intermediate drivers uh, and that encodes the four possible states, right? The output enable is low and the input request is low. The output enable is low and the input request is high and so on, right? Output enable high, low, high, high, high. Right, so we have R0 through R3. Now R0 and two are both for the input request being low, right? Being false. And so that forwards to R.F. R1 and R3 are both for the input request being true. And so that forwards to, to the output request um, for true on R. Then when we reset, 
we can notice that we only have to wait for uh, that particular enable to go low. Because in the valid state, only one of the two enables is low. And so once that one enable is low, we know that the uh, output enables are in the neutral state. Right, so this doesn't actually add any more transistor stack length to our, re our reset phase rules. Uh, the rest of the handshake on, on LE here and uh, on the upgoing rule of LE has so far been left untouched, right? It's still driven by RF and RT. So now that we have the state information stored in our forward drivers, we actually need to get that state information down to the rule on LE. The problem is, again, we lose it the moment we go through this reset phase, right? Our forward drivers transition back to a neutral state and we've lost all information that we saved in them. So then we, we need to uh, pass them into an internal memory so that we don't lose that information, right? Effectively, we're playing hot potato with the uh, enable information with the value from the enable uh, uh, from the output enable. Right. First, we pass it to our forward drivers. Then we pass it to an internal memory. Then we pass it to our uh, input enable. Okay. So we've added um, a latch, right? Uh, and we're going to tie it into our handshake. So the first thing is that uh, the the states that drive our latch to zero are uh, come from r.ef, right? The, the false enable rule on r. And so that's stored in r0 and r1, which means that we can use r0 and r1 to drive v0 high, right? And, like, and uh, similarly, we have uh, the true values for the output enable being stored in R2 and R3. So we can use those two to drive uh, V1 high. Then we need to make sure that we wait for uh, the input, so for the internal memory to stabilize, right, before resetting the forward drivers. And we, since we know which uh, forward driver drives which value on V, we just need to wait for the opposite of that on the reset phase. So because R0 drives V0 high, it drives V1 low. So we need to wait for V1 low on the reset phase of R0. And we can do that for uh, each value, you know, each forward driver, R0, R1, R2, and R3. All right, so now we have a stable internal memory. It's set uh, once every cycle. But currently, it's never read. Uh, it's, it's just written. So now we need to read it. So we want to keep our rules on LE combinational, right? And we can use the value of the internal memory to gate our rule for LE up. And we're going to, this rule for LE up is going to split into two one for LE F up and one for LE T up. And now we know that the internal memory is going to be stable uh, all the way till the next cycle when we write the internal memory once more. And that will be, uh, we'll have to guarantee that that happens after LE goes down. But step one is we use the value on our internal memory to gate our uh, input enable. All right, so when V1 is low, that means V0 is high, which means that the last output enable was false. And so we use that to drive our, our input enable, uh, the false rail of our input enable high. If V0 is low, then V1 is high, which means our last output enable was true. And so we can use that to drive the true rail on our input enable. Then we can use kind of the, the combinational uh, uh, rules for the downgoing LE, right? We just 
uh, stick the, the related combinational rules in uh, because it stays, V stays stable. We're going to assume V stays stable. However, V right now in this production rule set, uh, V has the possibility of changing uh, before LE, either LEF or LET is lowered right before LE goes back to its neutral state, which means that uh, as V changes, the value uh, that is currently valid on LE could start switching and then uh, become unstable, right? Uh, as uh, V0 switches and then LE goes to neutral state in parallel. So that means we need to gate the transition on V uh, based upon LE, right? We need to wait for LE to be neutral before letting V transition to its new value. And so we do this uh, by just, uh, you, it's, it's another protected forward drivers method, right? Uh, using the uh, input enable this time rather than the input requests or the output enable or uh, even a uh, mutual exclusion element, because we're not protecting uh, the forward drivers this time, we're protecting LE, right? Down going rules in LE. And so uh, if, if V0 is transitioning high, then it will drive LEF high, and that's only problematic if LET is currently high and LEF is low. If LEF is already high and LET is already low, then V0 transitioning high won't cause any kind of instability. So we only need to wait for LET to be low, right? Because right now, one of these two is high. We need to wait for them both to be low ultimately before transitioning V because otherwise we could start switching which one is high while LE, F, and LET are both trying to transition low. And so you could end up with a glitch. So this is the positive exchange channel. Uh, and the benefits of the positive exchange channel are that the, uh, the input enables remain valid and they are valid when uh, computing your forward drivers that you're going to send into the input into the input requests, right? So if if I'm designing a uh, a process that's going to drive L dot F uh, and L dot T, right? We can now use L E F and L E T in the computation to drive L F and L T, right? Directly. Uh, because it is valid during that half of the cycle. The downside is, of course, that uh, you have to play hot potato with the information from the output enable to get it from the output enable through the forward drivers, through an internal memory, and into your input enables. Right, And so the handshake is ultimately uh, more complicated. All right. So that brings us to the next approach, which is the negative exchange channel. Now in the negative exchange channel, uh, the, the input requests go valid, and that then causes the uh, input enables to transition to valid, uh, followed by a neutral state in the, uh, in the input requests, and then a neutral state in the input enables. Now the valid state in the input enable is still one high, one low, but the neutral state is one, one, right? It's both high. So it's a bit of an inverted uh, encoding. So we have to take care about implementing that. Again, the CHP is the same. We, the, the channel on L first receives uh, the input requests into the intermediate variable L and then says, sends the uh, the value stored on V out on LE. The uh, 
channel R sends the intermediate value from L uh, down the output requests and then receives the input enabled into the, right? So again, the input enable still sends an extra kind of initialized value before forwarding the next output enable, right? There's still kind of an extra token there. So again, we're gonna start with our weak condition half buffer, you know, one bit reshuffling. Once again, our first step is to uh, add in the extra uh, information about our output enables. This time, instead of just looking at a single output enable being high, we have to wait for both output enables to be high because that is the neutral state, right? So we're waiting for the neutral state on our output enables here, and we're waiting for a valid state on our output enables here. And the valid state is one is low. Okay. So the next step is, again, we're going to need our internal memory. Uh, and we're going to need our internal memory to, uh, to remember the output enable that we observe when it goes into its valid state. Because the current one that we're going to be sending down LE is from is for this cycle, and the one that we're going to be observing in RE is for the next cycle. Right, so we still need an internal memory. All right. So then we're going to write it. So when when we see when we drive our output requests, right, our forward drivers, if R dot F goes high or R dot T goes high, then our input enable will go valid, right? Either R E F will go low or R E T will go low. And we can use that to directly drive the value on our internal memory. Right, so if REF goes low, then we know that we can store it into V0, V0 goes high, V1 goes low, and we can save it for our next cycle. Okay. So then we're gonna need to make some space and uh, we need to save we need to acknowledge the write into our internal memory uh, in our reset phase of our forward drivers. So if REF went low, then we need to wait for V1 to go low in response, right? V0 is high, V1 low. If RET went low, then we need to wait for V0 to go low in response. So V1 is gonna be high, V0 is low, right? And that guarantees that we wait for our internal memory to transition. Okay, the next step is that we have to drive LE, right? The value on LE. And we have to use V to do it, right? So V stores the current value that we're gonna be sending back on LE in the downgoing rule here, right? But the moment that we forward a request on our forward drivers, it gives, the opportunity for the output enable to go low, which will write our internal memory, right? And so we need to store the value from our internal memory in our forward drivers so that we don't lose that information. And so we do that once again by breaking our forward drivers into four different intermediate forward drivers uh, to store our four different cases, right? Case one is V0. LF, case two is V0 LT, V1 LF, V1 LT, right? So that's that's driving R0 through R3. So now R0 and two handle the LF case, R1 and R3 handle the LT case, and so those drive RF and RT respectively. And now when we drive our four drivers, yeah, we'll lose our information from V, but we've stored it in our forward drivers. And so we don't need to worry about any kind of instability. All right. So now we can use our forward drivers to drive LE. So when 
for case, so for R0 and R1, V0 was high, so we drive LEF low. For R2 and R3, V1 was high, and so we drive LET low. Right? And so this drives LE into a valid state. And then on the reset phase, we wipe out all of our information in our forward drivers, and that naturally resets LE to a neutral state, right? Both being high. And so this is uh, very efficient for, uh, for our internal memory, right? For that part of it, for uh, the rules on LE, right? If you end up with long rules in LE, you can use this method and you'll end up with much shorter rules on LE. Uh, however, you'll end up with much more complicated reset rules here uh, in our forward drivers and much longer set rules in our forward drivers because you have to wait for the neutral state, which means you've got to check every single value of minority. Um, so this can, when combined with methods that I will show you in, uh, in the implementation strategy lecture, can be very effective. Uh, however, it's still just as expensive until then uh, as the uh, positive exchange can. Uh, one final bit, uh, and that is uh, if V0 is high, then we know that REF was the output enable that went low. So RET is already high from the, from the previous cycle, right? Which means that we don't need to wait for RET for this, for R0, right? If V0 is high, RET is already high. If V1 is high, REF is already high as part of the valid state for RE, which means that we can remove it from our forward drives. At high level, why do we want to use Possibly um, so if you are working with a uh, system where you need to get some kind of status information after each uh, after each request, then exchange channels uh, are the natural implementation of that because you don't burn energy on both the uh, input enable and then a further set of requests coming back to you. Right, you you you've effectively taken two channels and you've squashed them together. Um, and so, uh, think of like, uh, I think the natural example is a counter. Right, you want to implement a counter, and, and we'll go through this in the next lecture. Uh, but you want to implement a counter where you send an increment or a decrement and say it tells you whether or not the counter is empty or full. Right. Uh, then, after each increment or decrement you can have the enable tell you that directly rather than, say, uh, a separate channel, right? And in particular, if you want to gate your decrement uh, on there actually being a value in the counter, right, not just zero, then you can do that with that status. And is this strictly an Chrome's optimization or is it that you implement different specifications as a counter? In this case, we think that basic counter could have an explicit polar empty signal as a separate channel. This is strictly an optimization, but in general, the rule is uh, anytime you are able to optimi optimize away circuitry, you make more room in the handshake for more complex behaviors, right? Uh, because you, you don't have to fit as much as many events into that handshake. And so the handshake naturally operates faster, which means you can put more in, in order to match the, the standard, it's like uh, 12 transitions for WCHV. Right. Yep. We are in lecture 19. And we have two examples, E1 and E2. In E1, we are building the positive exchange channel. All right, the positive exchange buffer from L to R. If we look at uh, channel.act, then we'll find the channel definition here, right? And it's basically we have 
some number of request rails and some number of enable rails uh, uh, dictated by N and M respectively. Uh, and so in our example here, we have two request rails and two enable rails. And our goal is to implement this uh, positive exchange buffer uh, with a WCHB reshuffling with one bit going forward and one bit going back. Now notice that there is not a source or a sync defined here. It is just the device under test. And the reason for that is if we look in e1.rc, we'll find that we've given the simulator information about both LE and LD, right? The request on L and the enable on L. And we're telling it that the channel L is an enable protocol, right? And uh, it's an enable protocol based on that being on, on the upper request being valid and the uh, and the enable being valid, right? So it goes request valid, uh, enable neutral, request neutral, enable valid, right? That's an enable protocol. Uh, and we'll get to the acknowledge protocol on the other side. Uh, then we tell it to inject values from E1 underscore L uh, into the request of our channel L and to do so repeatedly, right? So that's our loop here. Then for R, again, we tell it we have uh, a one of two encoding on RD and on RE, uh, and it is active high, right? So that means the neutral state is zero, zero, the valid states are zero, one, and one, zero. Active low means the neutral state is one, one, the valid states are zero, one, 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 zero. Okay, so then we tell it we have uh, a channel on R, it's an enable protocol uh, with our output requests and our output enable, right? Again, valid, neutral, neutral, valid. Uh, and then we're going to inject uh, into the channel R on the acknowledging uh, wires, so L or sorry, RE, Right, and we're going to pull the values from e1 underscore r dot dat, and we're going to do so repeatedly in a loop. Right, so effectively, our uh, simulator PR sim is driving the source and the sync for both L and R. The rest of e1 dot rc is the same. Uh, the values in uh, e e1 underscore l and e1 underscore r are are just random values so let me open up e1.act and we can get started so our goal is to implement a uh, positive exchange buffer weak condition half buffer uh, from l to r uh, one bit for one bit back we're going to start with our production mode body prs g d g g d and then we're going to uh, build uh, a real quick uh, weak condition half buffer uh, just to give us a little bit of structure uh, so that we can work with it so and l dot r, uh, r dot d, r dot, just start with d zero, I guess. Uh, r dot d zero up, and then d zero, l dot e down, uh, r dot e, and not l dot d zero, r dot d zero down, and not r dot d zero, l dot e up. All right. Uh, pretty straightforward. We condition half buffer. Let's uh, give ourselves some data. So let's copy this. D L dot D1, R dot D1, uh, copy this, uh, L dot D1, R dot D1. And then we need to add the respective rules in L dot E, so not R dot D1, and then or R dot D1 here. Okay, that's a dated one bit WCHB. Uh, so let's uh, add in the information for our multiple enable signals from RE. So this is going to be uh, valid uh, in the uh, in the set phase, so we're we're checking for r dot e zero or r dot e one, right? A valid state, uh, and then we're going to do the same thing down here, uh, r dot e zero or r dot e one, right? And so now in the reset phase, we're going to be checking for a neutral state, so not r dot e zero and not r dot e one. Uh, and then again, 
not r to e0 and not r to e1. OK, uh, let's give ourselves some space here. Now, when we raise our forward requests, we'll lose all information about re. Uh, so we need to save that in our forward requests, right? That's step one. So let's break apart our forward requests into four cases. So we need uh, four internal uh, intermediate drivers. So R0 through four. So that would be that. And then we, we probably want to build the uh, internal nodes for those C elements as well to start. Okay. Uh, now let's break this apart. So we have uh, RE0 and LD0. That's the first one. RE1 and LD0. That's the second one. Uh, RE0 and LD1. And then RE1 and LD1. And those will drive, uh, let's do uh, R0 up, R1 up, R2 up, R3. Okay. So now uh, we know that R0 or R1 drives R.D0 up, and R2 or R3 drives R at D1. It's the set phase. Let's do the reset phase. So we're going to split uh, this rule into two and then this one into two. Uh, and so because for R0, R dot E went high, we only have to wait for, because R dot E0 went high, we only have to wait for R dot E0 to go low. We don't have to wait for R dot E1 because it's already low. So we can get rid of that. Uh, and then same reasoning, but R dot E1 this time. And then R E0 and R E1. And this is going to drive uh, R0, 1, 2, and 3 our intermediate forward drivers. Then we need to drive uh, our actual forward drivers, right? So not R0 and not R1 drives R.D0 down. Not R2 and not R3 drives R.D1 down. OK, uh, now we have uh, the information from our output enable stored in our intermediate forward drivers. So we can use that to set a an internal memory, right? Because we have to get it past the reset phase so we can use it in LE. Let's do that. So we're going to have, um, so it's a it's an up down rule for our uh, our internal memory. So not V1 or something drives V0 high. That's the up rule, right? Not V0 or something drives V1 high. Then the down rule is, not, is V1 and something drives V0 low, right? V0 and something drives V1 low. So that's an internal memory. Uh, then the thing that we want to store is the value uh, that is currently stored by our uh, uh, forward intermediate forward drivers, right? So uh, if r dot e zero was high, then we want to set v zero, and so that would be r zero or r two. So not underscore r zero uh, or not underscore r two, uh, and then for v one, it would be r one or r three. So not underscore r one or not underscore R3. OK, uh, then we need to put in the uh, combinational rules uh, for V0 down and V1 down. So underscore R0 and underscore R2, and then underscore R1 and underscore R3. So that sets our internal memory. Now we need to wait for it to stabilize in the reset phase of the handshake. Uh, so if R0 was high, 
then V0 has been set high and V1 has been set low. And so we need to wait for the downgoing rule on V1. If R1 was set high, then V1 was set high and V0 was set low. So we need to wait for the downgoing rule on V0. If R2 was set high, then V0 was set high and V1 was set low. So we need to wait for the downgoing rule on V1. And uh, same reasoning for, for R3 and V0. Okay, so we have our internal memory. We have pass, successfully passed the information from the output enable into our internal memory. Uh, and now we need to use that to set LE. So uh, we have two signals for LE, LE0 and LE1. So let's just uh, create rules for those. LE0, LE1. All right, uh, and now we need to gate our uh, upgoing rules on LE using V. So if we want to set LE0 high, then that would require uh, V0 being high which requires V1 being low. So not V1 and not R0 and not R1. Uh, same reasoning for LE1 going high. Uh, if we're setting LE1 going high, then it's because V1 is high and therefore V0 is low. So not V0 and. Then we need to put our uh, combinational uh, side on the other, on the downgoing rules, right? So. Uh, V1 or, and then V0 or. Okay, uh, finally, this production rule set is currently unstable uh, because uh, the uh, rules for our internal memory can drive a transition on our, our internal memory while LE is still valid. And so we wanna wait for LE to be neutral, right? So, uh, in the worst case, it would be uh, not L.E0 and not L.E1 uh, and and then uh, one of our four drivers, right? So let's just put that in across the board. LE, not L.E0 and not L.E1. And then the uh, combinational side would be uh, L.E0 or L.E1 uh, or R0, underscore R0 and underscore R2. And then same thing for V1, L.E0 or L.E1 or uh, then our forward drivers. Okay, uh, but we wanna optimize this a bit. So when V0 is going high, it's because R.E0 was high uh, and uh, if V0 is going high and V0 is already high, then it won't cause any changes in LE. And so if LE1 is low, then V0 is already high, which means we need to wait for uh, LE0 to be low. Right, so for V0, uh, if LE1 is low, then V0 is already high. If LE, uh, otherwise we have to wait for LE0 uh, to be low. Does that reasoning make sense? Okay, uh, for V1, if uh, we're driving V1 high, uh, if LE0 is low, then V1 is already high. Um, and therefore, we only need to wait for LE1 to be low. I believe. Now, I may have that reasoning messed up, but let's see. And so we can get rid of the uh, combinational rules, uh, the related combinational rules in, in the downgoing of our uh, internal memory. Okay. So the next step is to make this uh, CMOS implementable, right? So uh, we have uh, our forward drivers. These need to be driven by uh, our 
internal nodes on our C elements. So these are down going rules now. And then not underscore R0 drives R0 high and do that for all four. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, we need uh, internal rules for our uh, rules here, right? So uh, let's see, R, C1, let's do pool underscore RD. Let's do two of them. So this is going to be underscore RD zero down. And then underscore RD one down. Not underscore D zero drives RD zero up. Not underscore RD one drives RD one up. Okay, we need to do the same thing for our reset phase. So these need to be driving our uh, internal node on our C element. So go. These are upgoing rules. And then those need to drive our for our intermediate for drivers. One, two, three. And one, two, three. Okay, same thing for here. Uh, these drive internal nodes, so underscore D zero up, underscore R D one up, uh, underscore R D zero when it's high, that drives R dot D zero low, and that drives R dot D one low. Okay. Uh, next set is reset. Let's do that. Now let's start with our uh, reset phase. So we're going to look for, uh, let's try to do this trickly. So uh, I'm going to set, uh, let's see. We're going to set not g dot underscore s reset or, uh, and then we need that. Okay. And then for here, we're going to set uh, g dot underscore s reset and. Um, so this would be g dot underscore s reset and I love and in regex. Okay, so that's our reset for our four drivers, our intermediate four drivers. Uh, let's do reset for our uh, internal memory. So we want to set v0 high to begin with. So this is going to be not g dot underscore s reset or, and then over here it's going to be g dot underscore s reset and, and then we want to set this, uh, we want to set v1 low, so it's going to be g dot s reset or, and then not g dot s reset and, and we're going to have to surround that with parentheses. Okay. Let's see how I did. Uh, I probably messed something up along the way. So make E1. Uh, step one, uh, array instance R is incompatible with previous same name, E1 direct. Line six underscore R and R. Cool, let's call that X. Uh, so we're gonna look for, oops. we're gonna look for, our open bracket, we're going to call it x open bracket. Uh, and then we need to rename these variables x and x. Okay. v1 not identified. Okay. So we need to declare v0 and v1. Cool. v0, v1. Clean, make a zero length array. Let's check that. Ah, so this is four. Uh, and clean. I need to be in the broccoli command line interface. There we go. All right, let's run this through PRSIM. So PRSIM e1.prs source e1.rc. 
And it looks like I screwed up somewhere. So, uh, we got weak interference, cause RD1, unstable. So this is probably too late in the game. Let's uh, let us pipe it out to a file so that we have it. T e1.sim, uh, source e1.rc, quit e1.sim, and let's check, take a look at uh, e1.act. We're going to search for our first instability. L.e0 down is unstable. Cause r.d0 goes uh, neutral. R.d0 goes low. OK, uh, let's see. That means I probably screwed up the uh, logic around LE. Let me switch them and see what happens. Yep. So let's take a look at that logic again. All right. So if we're driving V0 high, then we need to wait for LE1 to go low, because that means that V0 uh, wasn't high in the first place. It's really easy to get mixed up with this. <laughs> uh, if we're driving V0 high, then LE1, and, and it's not vacuous, right? So there's going to be a transition for V0 from 0 to 1. That means V0 is low, and LE1 could be high. So we need to wait for it to go low. And so we're getting to the limits of what I can keep in my head. As you can see, it's easy to get mixed up with these things. Um, and that is ultimately what causes long development times in, in this design methodology, right? In templated synthesis, is that you have to keep all of these relationships between the variables in your head. The methods that I've shown you so far are the best ones that, that I know of uh, to think about them. However, it still gets complicated. So uh, the only uh, solution that I know that works so far is to just stare at the problem for a long time. 